Ecclesiastes chapter number 7, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of the fools is in the house of mirth. Now, the reason that I so like the books of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes is that God gave great wisdom to a man because he asked for it for God's glory. Solomon, we read, asked for wisdom to judge God's people correctly. And God not only blessed him with great wisdom to judge the people of God as their king, but he also gave him everything else on top of it because his heart was for what the Lord would have him to do rather than what his heart would have him to do. And with this great wisdom, Solomon knew that he wasn't going to be able to take it with him. I mean, when he went into the grave, his wisdom would have been laid in the ground with him unless God gave it to somebody else. So he purposed in his heart to record it. And sometimes, reading the books of Proverbs or Ecclesiastes, you run across things that are contrary, or your flesh would say are paradoxical. But not the case. All it takes is the Holy Ghost revealing it to you, and then it makes perfect sense. But the things that Solomon was blessed to see, I mean, we can go back a few chapters, nothing new under the sun. Right? These truths are just as true today, but the reason that he pinned them down and the reason that I believe God inspired them to pin them down by the Holy Ghost was because just because it happened back when they had no Wi-Fi and you know, no traffic lights and maybe not even paved roads at this point in time. Right? It may have had cobblestone road, but mostly dirt in this day. Right? No suspension if you did have a chariot. Right? No air conditioning. None of the things that we take for granted, but yet these truths are still true and the reason that Solomon was blessed to discover many of these things is that he took the time to sit down and meditate on the things of God one thing we don't do enough is meditate on the things of God in fact everything about this world is designed to keep our attention span everywhere else at any given moment but here verse number one he says a good name is better than precious ointment now when I read that phrase precious ointment it brings to mind that alabaster box of Mary you know, in many of the descriptions we know that it was a very precious box, but in one it said a very precious ointment of spikenard right an ointment is not what we would think of you know an ointment now it wasn't neosporin right it wasn't Vaseline mixed with a whole bunch of other stuff that keep it from getting infected it wasn't a perfume because the Bible does talk about perfumes All right, this was an ointment an ointment was to preserve something. In Mary's case, you know, we can go and study it out. She purchased that alabaster box and put it up against the day of the Lord's death that she might give him a proper burial. That the ointment wasn't going to do him any good, but it would do his deceased body good. Little did she know, you know, they were going to destroy the body that he came with. Three days later, he rose with a new one, and then he took that one to glory. Right, but... Fortunately, right, she realized that he was worthy of the ointment while he was still here. Instead, after he was gone, she broke it over his head. That filled the whole house, the Bible says, with the aroma. But the point of the ointment wasn't the smell. Keep in mind, it was meant for somebody that was dead. She was going to put it on him after he died, if he was like you and I, and he entered into the grave and then never came back out. Right? Didn't do anybody any good for something to smell good if it's going into a tomb. Right? The smell wasn't the point. What was the point? It was the preservation of the ointment. They didn't have formaldehyde back in the day. Right? In fact, you go study it out. What did Nicodemus brought a hundred pounds worth of garments and spices with Joseph of Arimathea to bury Christ. About a hundred pound weight. They wrapped them in a lot. Okay, they didn't have the benefit of what we do nowadays have with caskets that can seal and lock everything inside of it. Right? They didn't want the smell getting out. 
that, that's why when Jesus said Lazarus come forth how could Lazarus have walked out if he was wrapped with a hundred pounds of grave clothes right? he said come forth and then Lazarus came forth whether he could have walked or not that same one that said let there be light he said come out he's coming out then he tells them after him loose him and let him go we don't have time to get on all that but point being this was meant to preserve him keep him from stinking right well here's Solomon saying good name is better than precious ointment he's saying the thing that you think can preserve your flesh the best Right? Whatever it is that you think will cause you to live long days. I mean, he's already told us. And we can go back to Proverbs and everything up in Ecclesiastes to this point. The only thing that's going to preserve you is the grace of God. The only thing that's going to preserve you is loving the law of God and living by the law of God. Right? Letting God instruct you in the way that you ought to live and then doing your best to live it. Because it's we can go back. he's seen every work of man and none of it lasts none of it satisfies and it doesn't matter what great feat man does he always wants something bigger and better to make him feel like what he did was better than what his fathers did he says a good name not a great name right in the eyes of men not a prestigious name he says a good name is better than precious ointment how much did Mary's ointment cost her? Well, about a year's wages, the Bible tells us. Okay, well, then again, that was just based off of Judas's speculation because he's a cheapskate. He wanted to go and sell it off. Right? About a year's wages. Now, I don't know how much you make in a year, but if somebody walked in and said, hey, would you like to have this? And it was a year's wages. Don't you think, well, yeah, no, no strings attached? I don't don't tell the government about it. I don't have to pay taxes on it. Yeah, we're good. But who in their right mind wouldn't say, if it's free, yeah, I'll take a year's wages. Here he's saying, forget about the monetary value. Forget about what it could do for you know, your body. There's still places today, they tell me there's one down there in St. Lucia. I'm not crazy enough to go down there and try it, but they say that there's the, around that volcano, there's a mud pit that if you get in it, Whatever's in that dirt is good for your skin. But there's one problem with that. It's on the side of a volcano, which means i got to go hiking to get there. No, thank you. Right? I, me and hiking don't go well together. Okay. Second, right? i got to sit in mud. for how They, they never tell you how long. Right? And then how do you get the mud off? If I'm sitting in mud, there's going to be mud places I don't want mud to be. Right? How do you get rid of that with other people around? I don't want to find out. But, but today, you can spend a whole lot of money and go down there. And they say you go out looking better than ever. Yeah, but it's dirt, and it's going back to the dirt. It's only skin deep. And you can spend all that money for what? One less wrinkle? I got a whole lot more than one, and I'm only 28. We're not going to get on some of the people in here that are older than me. If you could say, I, I got rid of one wrinkle, well, I smoothed that one bump in that road that they're building out there. Didn't make much of a difference. Nothing new, under, it didn't change anything. More is still going to show up after you took that one away. But let me in on, let y'all in on another secret. I put cologne on before church today. Guess what? I'm going to have to put cologne back on before I come back to church tonight. Why? Because it's not going to last especially after I get done sweating from teaching Sunday school. Right? Those things that, well, hey, Jordan smelled pretty good this morning. Yeah, that's thanks to polo, not because I smell good. Likewise, there's a price tag on that polo. It, it wasn't ridiculous. Right? If it was, I wouldn't be able to afford it. But here, he said all the things that people think will help them, you know, they spend in putting good glad everybody's dressed nice God bless us with good clothing right God's been good to us that's why we put on our best when we come to his house because we want to do right by him but here he's saying everything that people amass a precious ointment ointments were rare a precious ointment even rarer he says and what's the point of that it's for the outward it's for appearance now don't get me wrong take showers 
put deodorant on. I'm not saying we're not getting into that. If you get, if you got cologne, put cologne on. But at the same time, if all you can think about is, well, I want to be presentable to other people, no. He says, as much as it was honored in that day, a precious ornament, it is a good thing. Better than that. Good name. That may, let's be honest. Okay, if you've got somebody, let's say you know them, by reputation, somebody referred them to you, they're doing work on your house. If they've been there for eight hours, Brother Mike, and you go outside and they smell all pretty and they don't look sweaty, what are you going to be thinking? What in the world were they doing for eight hours at my house? Right? Not one shingle's been changed out. But yeah, we've got a lot of people that, as far as the Lord's concerned, He called them to work. Called His servants. Said that we were soldiers of Christ. Yet yeah, we got too many people pampering. Not enough people doing the work that the Lord would have you do. I don't mind if I go outside and the guy who, in the summer, has been doing shingles on the roof all day, I don't mind shaking his hand if he's all sweaty and he smells funky. Right? That guy's got a good name. It means he put in good effort for the money that I was giving him. I would expect that. Right? In my experience, most plumbers don't care what you think they look like. They care about getting the job done. Right? Most garbage men, they got uniforms. Right? They got the name on the uniform. They got a truck with the big name on the side, but they really don't care if something gets on them because that's not what they're wearing home that day. Right? They, I guarantee you they brought an extra change of clothes. Right? I guarantee you that before they get back to wherever they're going and hop into their bed at night, they're going to take care of all the smell. But when they're busy about business, they don't care what the outward looks like. They just care about getting the job done. They'd rather have a good name. Sometimes a good name doesn't come with rainbows and a you know acclaim and applause and in fact very often does it. Because if you really care about what people think, you're more concerned about getting the job done, being responsible. Whatever you've been entrusted with, being a good steward with it. So here he's saying you could spend most of your life trying to Keep together things that smell great, that'll preserve this temporary shell that we're in. You can build a great big barn, but if you don't live to see tomorrow, whose goods are those things in the barn really going to belong to? You can't take them with you. He says, good name, more value. As I was reading that, really, what do you have here right now? that you can take to heaven with you. As far as I can tell, Brother Bob, there's only one thing. That's your testimony. You can't take souls with you because I can't even take my own soul. I was bought with a price. My life's no longer my own. God doesn't hold things that aren't His. So if I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit, it's because the Holy Spirit owns me. I'm not even taking my own soul to heaven. You say, well, we won people to the Lord. No, He did the work. We just pointed them in the right direction. We're supposed to plant in the water. Right? What field worker gets to take home the crop at the end of the day? No, the guy who owned the farm and paid the farm worker, he's the one that gets to keep the fruit. I mean, the Bible tells us that we ought to be like trees planted by the living water. Right? That we're to bear much fruit, but what tree gets to keep its fruit? If a tree bears fruit, somebody comes along and picks it off of it. We're supposed to give away the fruit in our life to those that either don't know them or do know them just to be good to them but to remind them taste and see that the Lord is good we don't get to keep our fruit we don't get to keep our works we don't get to keep our I mean we don't even get to keep our tears I read that God bottles up the tears of the saints once they leave my eyeballs they're not mine no more but God claimed them as his own so really what can you take to heaven except your name for the cause of Christ. Your reputation. What you did with what God put in you. Because I do find that we will be known as we are known. 
I do find that when people see me in glory one day, I'm not going to look like me, I'm going to look like him. But you're going to look at me, even though I look like him, and you're going to know me as I was. Right, you just explain that, Brother Mike. I'm still wrapping my head around that one. I'm still trying to wrap up my I've come to realize it doesn't matter. But, right, the Bible says that when he comes back to rapture the church out, those which were dead, they're going to be called up first because they need a little bit of extra time to put on a new body. Then he's going to call us up, and we're going to be quickly changed, and then together we'll be with the Lord. Does that mean the people in heaven right now don't have bodies? Doesn't matter. It's just things I wonder about sometimes. Right? Did, did I have the form of a body, but it's just a spirit? And then I realized one day, well, the Father and the Son had no problem with the Holy Spirit for since the Alpha time. Doesn't matter. Right? In fact, there are a few times that people saw the Holy Ghost. Go look at Jesus' baptism. Anyway, it's not a problem for God. It's just something I wondered about one day. But he's saying, you can't take it with you. Only thing you can take is your name. But then that begs the question, well, what does it take to have a good name? Uh, let's keep on reading. It says, a good name better than the precious ointment and in the day of death than the day of one's birth. Now again, to the flesh, that don't make sense. Matt, we'll pick on Riker because Riker's not in here. Okay, Riker... Ball of energy. Right? He's going to go exploring. He might get lost, but he'll find his way back home eventually. Right? Riker, any baby, they're born. A whole lot of celebration. In fact, they throw parties for the baby before the baby shows up. They're called baby showers. Right? That's how people, you know, excited people get about the gift that God gives to families called children because they are a heritage of the Lord. Right? People get all excited for babies showing up. We don't throw, you know, whatever the equivalent of a we don't throw a funeral shower. Right? That's counterintuitive. But according to your King James Bible, the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. If you have a good name. Honestly, what's that baby ever done? Nothing. Right? In fact. All it's been is a pain to the mom for about eight months because the first month, it's not big enough to do any damage. And then it starts kicking. And then it starts, you know, getting all twisted up around in there. Makes her have a whole bunch of funny cravings for like jalapenos at two in the morning, right? According to all the movies that I've seen. I don't know if that's actually accurate. But, baby comes into the world. It was conceived in sin. It was born in sin. It's a sinner by trade. Wines, nothing's wrong with it. Just wants attention. But you can't blame the baby because most of the time the parents just want attention. Right? It's a learned habit. But what's that baby brought into the world? Nothing. If nothing changed, what's that baby going to take out of this world? Nothing. Right? In truth, all a birth is is potential. But the day of one's death if they have a good name, they realize their potential in the Lord. A good name is one that left nothing behind. That put everything that they had into the ministry. You say, well, they weren't a preacher. No, but I know a lot of people that have been praying a whole lot more and a whole lot longer than most preachers preach. I know people that can get up and sing a song and do just as much good to my heart is somebody that gets up and doesn't know what they're talking about when they open the Word of God. I know people that with a word fitly spoken can change not only the course of your day, but if you continue to meditate on those things, they have a great impact in your life. Now, it's not about what you are called to do. It is fulfilling that call to the best of your ability, but also understanding that if you yield, God will make you into what you need to be. God will qualify you for whatever He has called you to if you'll let Him, if you'll yield. And a good name is one that said, well, I may not understand why He picked me, what He wants to do with me, how He's going to do it, or what the end of it's going to be. I'm realizing that if like Jeremiah, in all the decades that he preached, 
We don't have a record of one convert. But yet, even in his darkest moment, he's ready to quit. He said, Lord, I'm not going to preach in your name. I'm not going to prophesy in your name. I'm not going to teach in your name. I'm done. Don't look down on him. Most people quit before they walk out the doors on Sundays. But in his darkest moment, right, he just got fed up and he vented. Anybody ever got a vent? Right? I had to stop venting because people thought that I was serious when I was venting. I just need to get it out of my head so I wouldn't think it no more. Right? Anybody have to do that? Didn't mean it, just needed to get it out because I was tired of thinking about it. But then, after he calmed down, what happened? There's a fire shut up within them. A good name is that even though they faced everything, they may have got knocked down, but they had a fire within them that caused them to get back up. They may have been told no a lot, but they just kept on going and asking because they were faithful. Because they found a hedge and a gap and they stood in it. Not just to fill it, but also to mend it, to make up the hedge, to repair it. They put themselves on the line because they loved the one that put himself on the line for them. Really, funerals ought to be celebrations if they had a good name. And if you've known people that have passed on and had a good name, there's sadness. But there's also respect, admiration, a lot of times it's people getting together and talking about the things that they liked most about the person that had passed on. And if they've got a good name for the Lord, all it does is bring more honor and glory to Him. Especially if a preacher gets to get up at the funeral and say, hey, this is why this person lived their life the way that they did, because they loved Jesus. And if you don't know Him, you certainly can. Believe it or not, I've been to funerals where they were shouting. Why? Because God showed up. You say, that's strange. No, it's strange that most of the time people don't have enough of a testimony in the things of God that people can take joy at their, you know, really it's just ascending on part. Hey, we'll see you in a bit. In fact, Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. But there are things to be about. And keep in mind back then to bury somebody. It took a whole lot of effort. Nicodemus and Joseph Arimathea we heard to talk about they was doing a rush job because Passover was coming and they had to get him in the grave and purify themselves before Passover came they did a rush job and still wrapped him in a hundred pound weight of spices and grave clothes nowadays we just brush it off on the mortician back then detailed process but a good name much value and the day of one's death should be more valuable than the day of one's birth. Because on the day of one's death, we should be able to stand around and hopefully, God will, and say for everyone that knows them, they fought a good fight, they finished their race, their course. They went out with just as much desire, anticipation, may not have been able to get around as well, may not have been able to do everything that they once did, but they still went out with the same fervor and passion for the things of God. That ought to be all our desires. But in order to have a good name, you've got to do some things. You've got to confront things that most people don't want to confront. Good name is a rare thing, not because it's un unobtainable, but because people are unwilling to go through what it takes to have a good name. If it's easy, everybody could do it. It is easy, and everybody can do it, but that doesn't mean that it's easy to live it. In theory, it's real easy to get to the MLB. All you got to do is be the best baseball player that anybody's ever seen because you worked hard enough to make all that happen. In theory, that's easy. Go do it. A whole lot harder. Well, verse number two. It is better to go in the house of mourning than the house of feasting. It's better to spend your time around a funeral home than it is down at the all-you-can-eat buffet. No, the house of feasting, that's talking about 
You know, literally, if somebody throw a feast, it's for a great reason. They's happy. They wanted to celebrate. It's weddings. Right? It's just because the master of the house had been blessed by God and he wanted to share the blessings that God had blessed him with to everybody else. But feast, big deal. Everybody go put on their best. They'd show up the equivalent of black tie only events. But here it's better for you to spend time down at the house of mourning than it is at the house of feasting. Why? Because for that is the end of all men, the house of mourning, and the living will lay it to his heart. All that a feast can teach you is that good times don't last. Don't remember nothing. Hey, I get it. Today's the fourth. Hallelujah. I don't have to work tomorrow. Right? Because even though it's not the fourth, we're celebrating it tomorrow at work. Hallelujah. Okay? I could have even taken off Friday, but I wanted holiday pay, so I went in on Friday. But he's, there's nothing wrong with the barbecue. Right? With gathering with friends and family. Take time. Celebrate the fact that God one day inspired men that believed the Word of God and that wanted to live by the Word of God, that tyranny wasn't the way to go. And because they... You know, one they're independent. They didn't found the country based off of what George Washington thought, or what Thomas Jefferson thought, or Madison, or any of the others. Right? They founded it off of Judeo-Christian principles because they feared an Almighty God. I'm thankful to live in a country that's founded that way. But when the feast is over, my life is not over. In fact, I leave feast a whole lot sooner than most people, other people do. Why? Because there's something that God put in me that big crowds of people drains the energy out of me and I need time. Okay, I'm going back to my bunker where it's cold and it's air conditioned and I can just chill. Right? That's just the way that I'm wired. Okay, the feast, it's great. But the feast isn't everything. Right? Why do you think Facebook's so popular? Because people can socialize with people without being around them that that doesn't make sense can't be social unless you're with some people in a social se- but anyway okay but it's that desire to always be involved to be around right as some people would say to bump shoulders with somebody to you know hobnob Right? You feel like, well, I really don't belong here, but hey, look at that person. Right? I've been in some of them situations. I wasn't impressed much. Why? Because they're just people. What are you going to learn at a feast? The people are people, and if you give people an opportunity or a stage, a lot of people are going to do something stupid, either for a laugh or because they think they're being funny. Now, let's be honest. We all people. But what happens if you go down to the house of mourning? You're reminded of that. You know why people wear these? You know why long before they had those, they started marking out the hours and counting the hours of the sun in the sky? Because they knew that they was running out of time. This isn't for you to be on time. It's that you remember that one of these days you're going to run out of time. That's why you got to do this now at this time because without it, you may never get it done. Down at the house of mourning, you're reminded that man's days are few and full of trouble. That our life is a vapor. Today is the day that the Lord has made, but we're not promised tomorrow. You're reminded of the fact that now is the most important time in the eyes of God. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, now. Now I can do something. You know, God forbid something happens. I'm free and have my mental faculties and enough control over my body because God, you know, by Him and through Him do all things. God hadn't decided to cripple me. But if He did, there'd still be a way to get around and do something for the Lord. Now. The house of mourning reminds you that yes, the weights of this world, the cares of this world, the hard times of this world are hard, but there's coming a day where we won't be able to accomplish anything. So I'd rather strive now to get something done for the Lord than to take it easy and go out with nothing. To stand before Him one day and have the deeds of my life from the time I got saved until the time that I died open up, not just in front of Him, 
right? But in front of all the saints. And I've got to stand there at the judgment seat of Christ and say, Lord, I knew better, but I didn't. I did do what you'd have me do, but I, I knew I didn't do it the way that you wanted me to do it. I gave 99%, not 100. I gave 1% and not 100. The house of mourning reminds us that we will stand before a thrice holy God and have to give an account of what I did now. Can't change what happened yesterday. I have no control over what happens tomorrow. I do have control over now. The house of mourning reminds us of what truly is valuable. Even today in some Jewish circles, they have, you know, it, you'll find it in Chinese cultures, a lot of Eastern cultures, where they take the remains. In fact, you know, Jesus talked, they brought out the prophet's bones and would put them on parade. They'd rewrap them and try and do service to those that had gone behind. That wasn't for the dead, that was for their own benefit. But there are places where if you have your loved ones, you know, interred or cremated, put them in urns, you rent spots like in apartment buildings where it's just rooms full of dead people in Eastern culture. And then you go and you put out meals for them on like their birthday or their anniversary, things like to honor the dead. That's foolishness. They're gone. That, their works do follow them, but that's not us honoring them. That's just their faithfulness for the Lord and the Lord being faithful to His promise that if we do do things for Him, they'll last a whole lot longer than we do. The house of mourning, I mean, really. All the pharaohs that got buried with all the stuff that they had. They thought that they were going to take it to another realm with them. Lie, I found it. It was in a big triangle that y'all built. It didn't go nowhere. It stayed there. Right? All the flowers at the funeral ceremony, somebody's got to take them with them. They're not going with the person. Right? They're burying it. I mean, you can throw flowers down there if you want to. It's not going to do anybody any good. Right? And if you leave the flowers at the funeral, you know, at the cemetery or the funeral home, I know what's going to happen to them. They're going to get rid of them. They don't have room for all the flowers. What do you say? All the honors that we can bestow. But the greatest honor is they had a good name for the Lord. Right? We don't see the other side of the funeral home where all the you know clothes that they had. Most of the time they end up getting donated somewhere, given to people, thrown away. Right? We see them. We don't think about all that they worked for and how little it all amounted to. And the only thing they took with them was their name. All I can take with me is what I decide to do for the Lord. I can't take the fruit with me, can't take the work with me, can't take the seeds with me, can't take the water with me, but I can take faithfulness with me. That's what it takes to have a good name. And it goes on to say, verse number 3, Sorrow better than laughter. For by sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. If you want to have a good name, you're going to have to face sorrow. Again, hardness. What happens when most people face sorrow or tragedy or depression? They try to mask the symptoms by living in a state of laughter. I had a bad day, I'm going to put on comedy. Don't get me wrong, Jim Carrey was very funny back in the 80s. Right? His movies does a lot of stupid stuff, but I thought it was funny. That's not going to help you when your heart is full of sorrow. You can go down to a stand-up comedy routine. You may laugh for a moment, but laughter, temporary. Sorrow is a state of being. If you are filled with sorrow, you need to address it if you want it to be resolved. Sorrow doesn't resolve itself. 
sorrow is a symptom of the fact that this flesh one it is corrupted there was no sorrow before there was sin sorrow is a result not necessarily of your but somewhere along the line sin's the reason that you're feeling the sorrow if it's because of the loss of a loved one it's because of sin sin entered, in, entered upon all men by one man death by sin Right, if it's because somebody broke your heart, it's because once sin entered into man, man's heart became deceitfully wicked. No man can know it. Right, if it's because of the way that somebody talked about you, we not too long ago over there in the book of James, unless I'm confusing what I taught in here with what I taught in teens class. Right, tongue set on fire of hell. Oh, what a you know great flame, little fire kindle it. Sorrow can come from all places, but we can trace back one thing, sin. And the effects of sin, whether you were the one that instigated the sin or not, if sorrow comes in, the effects of sin will not cure themselves. They will only infect and corrupt and continue to cause you more problems. Somebody with a good name doesn't say that every day was sunshine and roses. They have a good name because instead of masking it, you can fool me for a little bit. But those people that you're around every day, they're going to see it in the way that you talk, in the way that you walk, the way that you behave, your countenance. You can fool me when you come into church, but people around you know if there's something different deep down in here. And slowly you'll turn into some, whether it's a root of bitterness, whether it's grief, whether whatever the sorrow is that's in your heart, there's one way to get rid of it. That's to confront it. Again, sorrow better than laughter. For by sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. Sorrow causes sadness, not the other way around. But it's okay to be a little sad now if by your countenance. But if I'm sad for a little bit while I'm dealing with the sorrow, my heart is better for it. Trying to ignore the fact that I have sorrow in my heart, that I'm sad. Trying to muscle through it, just pretend that everything's okay. All that does is let that snare of the devil get a little bit tighter and tighter and tighter. Sorrow is not enjoyable by any means. It's the exact opposite. That's what sorrow means. But if sorrow gets you to the point that you threw a sad countenance, what's that mean? For a little bit, everybody's going to know that something's wrong. That's okay. As long as you get it made right. Especially in the house of God. We see somebody going through it. We ought to aspire to go and encourage, to exhort, to exalt to help bear one another's burdens. But even if nobody can help and everybody's going to know there's something wrong in my life, that's okay as long as it gets made right. you got to process serious emotions. Jesus tempted in all points like we... What's that mean? He knows what every single one of those emotions feel like. He knows how He overcame them and He will help you overcome them, but that entails dealing with them. Forty days He's fasting in the wilderness. You don't think that He knows what distraction, right? what temptation, I mean, no, the devil tempted Him. I, as far as I know, never been tempted directly by Lucifer himself. I, and I still have trouble with it. Right, he knows what betrayal feels like. He knows what it's like to be forsaken. Because at the end, there's only one left with him, and that was John, and he told him to leave. He said, Behold thy mother. And that same hour, he took her to his own home. He knows what it's like when everybody walked out. He knows what it's like to break fellowship with everyone and everything for the good of you. The sorrows that he felt, we can't even begin to comprehend. But because he experienced them and overcame them, 
He can help you with your sorrow. It's okay to admit everything's not sunshine and roses right now. In fact, those with a good reputation, they faced hardness, but they didn't shy away from it. By the grace of God, they overcame it. If it takes sitting down and realizing everything's not as happy as I've been pretending in order for you to get things in your heart made right, then that sad countenance was worth it. Those that pretend and try to mask and just keep living the lie that they wish that they had, those people, spiritual, maybe financial, maybe physical, destruction waits for them. Because they had a festering canker in their heart that they didn't allow the Lord to help them take care of. They were afraid to face their sorrow, so their sorrow overcame them. Sad countenance isn't fun. If you're like me, you don't like everybody coming up, hey, is everything all right? It will be, but just stop asking me. Now, we want to pretend that everything, it's okay to admit everything's not okay. As long as through that admission, we get it made right. We allow the Lord to take away the sorrow, the pain. All right, lastly, Verse number four, the heart of the wise man is in the house of the morning, but the heart of the fool is in the house of mirth. Mourning, by definition, means that there's a change. If you mourn something, you process it and you deal with it and then you move on. Nowadays we'd call that grieving. Grieving Mourning, by definition, means that there is progress. Some people never grieve a loss in their life, whether it's a person, whether it's a thing, whether it's a dream that they had when they were young and just didn't work out. People don't grieve the things in their life because they want to live in the past instead of focusing on now. The house of birth is trying to hang on to what we cannot have all the time, which is mirth. Right? There's a term for being happy all the time. It's called hilarity. And you know where that word comes from? Being psychotic. It means that something was so funny it made you go insane. And there are people that are trying to be happy and they are insane because you can't stay happy all the time. Happy is not permanent. Joy is. Peace is. Now, you can live in grace all the time and mercy all the time. You can't live in mirth all the time. Why do you think man turns to certain substances and certain uh, products to give them the feeling of mirth without having to go through all the effort of actually finding it? The fool spends his time down at the house of mirth. Eventually you're going to get like me, jaded and cynical and nothing's funny anymore. Truly, people chasing all the time. There are people through parties starting on Friday and they're going to end tomorrow and guess what's going to be on Tuesday? They're going to be miserable again. They tried to live at the house of mirth, but they couldn't take the mirth with them when they left. See the wise man down at the house of mourning, the house of grieving. person with a good name understands in order to go forward, I have to deal with what it right in front of me right here right now I can't go on and be useful for the Lord for the rest of this day unless I grieve and mourn some things right now grieving doesn't always mean that there's a death mourning doesn't always mean that you lose a loved one but you can mourn things in your life that didn't go the way you thought they were going to go why? to get it in the past so that you can accept what God's got for you now some people stay angry at God because they didn't get to do what they wanted to do for the Lord. Guess what? They never got down to the house of mourning. And that sorrow, that bitterness, maybe it could be envy or jealousy or whatever it is, festers in their heart for years and they never go on to do anything for the Lord because there was no room for the Lord in their heart because they never grieved those emotions, those 
dreams, those ideas that they thought that they could have. Right? There are some people that never grieve the fact that they're not as important as they think they are. I'm a nobody. I mean, we've got a whole bunch of preachers in the church. We've got a preacher right here. Get up. Do a wonderful job teaching. God doesn't need me. God chose me. Didn't have to, but He did. Some people think that they're a blessing to God. Wrong. It does bless the Lord when we live a life with a good name. God doesn't need nothing from me. He didn't get anything when He got me except a whole lot of problems and a whole lot of mess. But yet He agreed that if I'd let Him, He'd turn that mess into something that would bring honor and glory unto Him, be a vessel of honor for the Lord. Didn't say a vessel of honor to me. My name is nowhere on the vessel. The credit doesn't go to what's, you know, the vessel. The credit goes to what the vessel was used for. Who made the vessel? Keep me in the shadows. I'm fine with it. Some people never get over that. They never grieve their ego in the flesh. There are some people that never get over the fact that if they don't say something in the church service, you know, God can't show it. That's not true. Sometimes God don't want anybody to say anything, and He walks through here in a stillness, puts the fear of God in everybody, and you're afraid to breathe. Sometimes it gets high. And it may not be any testifying. Maybe like that one service, Brother Luther was here. Service was going, it was a great service. Wasn't any test. He just got up here and he said, Can I do something? He called us all up here. He just started saying how much he loved us. Then God filled this way. There's they were singing. They're shouting. There's a little bit of preaching. And then what happened? Then God showed up and threw it all off the rails. What do you say? Some people think, well, if I didn't get to sing, I really wanted to sing today. Maybe God didn't want you to sing today. Maybe it was your willingness to sing today that God honored and realized, you know what? Everybody was there to worship. I'm just going to forgo all of what they're going to do and show up and do something they can't do. That's fine with me, Lord. Go ahead and do it. I'd have been just as happy if God showed up during congregational before Sunday school. We didn't have Sunday school. I promise you. Some people never grieve the fact that even though the world tried to tell you that, you know, you're special and it revolves around you, that's not true. It's all about Him. I already said, by Him and through Him do all things consist. It's all made for His honor and glory anyway. It's just whether or not we get on schedule and agree with the fact that, yeah, I want my life to honor and glorify Him. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.